let's just forget that happened. Unless you favor the teams not named Minup, Bismarck, and Pierre. I guess you can say Heilman's had a fantastic finish with results that I will confess to you guys. Ones that I didn't expect to transpire. You might be thinking the same thing given how most recent matchups have gone. But I don't want to throw words into your mouth. Yeah, the first time attending the Heilman's performance tournament was not pretty. But it's not the end of the world either. We still have lots more season to go, and anything can happen in the next month. Good afternoon, or evening, or morning. I have no clue when you guys listen to these. And that is absolutely no problem. If you've been counting and not looking at the screen, or if you've been looking at the screen and not counting, or if you've been doing both, We'll probably find out at some point that you are listening to episode 4 of the Minded Sports Podcast Summer Series, a production of KMSU TV and Radio. Whenever that time is that you are listening, allow me to begin another feeding of important sports info straight into your ears. That easy. If you need to grab headphones, go ahead and pause. Go pick them up, pause if you need to, or if you're sharing with the family, either on the big screen, or you got them surrounded looking at the phone, or whatever device you're using, welcome. Let's do this thing. If you remember all the way back to the one second mark or whenever I started talking, I let it be known that discussions for the Heilman's Performance Tournament were coming first today. If you don't know what that is, basically, the Legion teams here in town, in the higher end of the division tree, the Minot Vistas, seems like this is an annual thing every summer. Corbett Field is lucky, and also Heilman's Performance also lucky to be sponsoring a tournament at this very complex where Minot is home for multiple teams from around the area. Some you might get from out of state. Some you're most likely to meet up with from inside of the state boundaries. But this is a nice little four or five team tournament kind of mid-season you know, just to kind of check up on how's your team doing mentally and physically by playing at such a high level during the season. This is kind of like a way to get the players engaged into elevating your play style and bringing that extra level of oomph to the lineup. Tournaments hit different than regular season games. Kind of that state tournament type of feeling, but not exactly quite that. But they still have a championship game for this tournament and declared champions as well. So they make this thing serious, but the results not quite to the extent of what you get from a state tournament. But still, high stakes are involved. And so, who participated in this tourney? Let me refresh your guys' memory from the last episode. Since it's in Minot, of course, you're going to have your host team, the Minot Vistas. The designated home team for all of their games... The Vistas were, in fact, just that. From Minnesota, you had East Grand Forks, which you would think probably that they're kind of at that same level as the clubs like Davies, the other Fargo teams, and Grand Forks Central. All the East teams out there. Well, heck, even Red River's there too. All the East teams at the high school level 
they don't mess around when it comes to baseball. You had Bismarck, which, of course, Bismarck is Bismarck. They're going to be good in a lot of things. You had Mandan. And then from South Dakota, the city of Pierre even brought some representatives to the party. So, got a team from Minnesota and South Dakota. Rest our ND teams. Pretty interesting, isn't it? And boy, this was for the first time going to this tourney. I certainly did not expect, you know, a lot of what went down over that weekend. Ended up being Mandan and East Grand Forks in the tournament championship game where Mandan would take it all, or rather declare champions of the tournament. But East Grand Forks made it interesting at the end. They loosened the gap that Mandan had an advantage over, but Mandan shut her down before anything got out of hand for them. After seeing what Minot did in their doubleheader series against the Chiefs, you know, Mandan just came in with a straight face, clamped down on any sort of distractions or any incapabilities that may have hindered their odds. They showed up and they balled out. They were balling out this tourney. So props to the Mandan Chiefs, you know, given the current status of what high school athletics are like, you'd almost think that, you know, Mandan would be the odd ones out, you know, given how, what's the Pierre team going to look like, you know, East Grand Forks, you know, all of those East teams are just... They're good at a lot of sports, and, you know, like I said earlier, Bismarck is Bismarck. You know, can they keep up with them? It pretty much ended up being, you know, the favorites kind of foiled their chances in this tourney. And so, if you see an opportunity, let's hope you pounce on it. That is exactly what Mandan did, despite losing the first game that opened up the tournament against the same East Grand Forks team that they beat in the championship. Pretty much not a single team went undefeated. Mandan came out as the winners, even losing just a game, you know, for the structure like this tournament. You can afford a loss, and you just hope you get lucky with the seeding and the run differential if you ended up with two losses after four games. But Mandan did what they needed to do, and for sure, that's what they did. They showed up. Minot, on the other hand, the host team... Yeah, I said it earlier. Let's just forget that happened. Losses in all three of their games played. First against the Mandan Chiefs, the eventual champions of the tournament, which that was actually a really fun game if you like offense. 16-15, to 15, like that was not a pitcher-friendly game. That was exciting to watch. Even if Minot lost it, you know, they still had three more chances to make up for it. But of course, as you can tell what's being said, that did not happen. And you know, yes, they do have three more chances to get it together, but it wasn't going to be easy. And so course, Bismarck being Bismarck, Minot, good thing they made it a competitive game against the Governors. They were not able to 
come up with the better end of the deal. And so now 0-2 on day one. And so that would just really be a tall hill to climb having to face a pure team, which, you know, how good are they coming from a different state? And of course, you know, the East teams, seeing what they can do at the high school level probably should be no different than the Legion level. So Minot on day two... Lost to the Pier team, Pier Post 8. That was a score of 6-3. So, 0-3. The final game got rained out. And so, why not? Given what had happened already, they just said, we'll be fine with the forfeit. And so, with that forfeit, that is how East Grand Forks got their shot at the championship trophy. Pierre and Bismarck, they were the neutral teams. 1-2, lost to that sort of deal. Middle of the pack crew. Mandan and East Grand Forks towards the top of the standings. And then Minot at the bottom. But this was a mid-season tournament that basically, I mean, confidence-wise, hopefully the Vistas can rebound from it. But it was a mid-season tournament that isn't the same as the state tournament. I've said it a few times now already. So the Vistas have time to hopefully right the ship again and come out firing in the second half of the Legion season. Once again, congrats to the Mandan Chiefs for winning the Highlands Performance Tournament. And let's not forget that the Vistas were crowned the winners of this tournament back in 2017 and 2019. So they do have some rich history in this tournament just wasn't their year this year. Hopefully next year will prove a better outlook. Sticking with the only sport, or one of the few sports rather, that we still have going on during this pandemic. The Sears Valley Sabredogs getting underway in their season. I said in the preview show, a race for a spot in the league championship series, three teams per division. It's basically going to be a bloodbath. And it'll be fun to watch. But for the Saber Dogs, just getting going early, we all knew having to face the defending champion, Badlands Big Sticks, was not going to be easy. The Saber Dogs still managed a few wins out of it. 13 to 1 on the home opener on June 29th. June 27th when they were on the road for their second game of the new season, 7 to 5. And now with a series against the Western Nebraska Pioneers who won the league's first championship, well, let's just say a lot of good outcomes and fortune happened for siding with the Dogs. This past weekend. 5 to 1, 7 to 4, 5 to 3, all wins for your dogs. I even interviewed some of the players after each game. I mentioned a lot about playing a complete game and just being really efficient at it. That's what the dogs were this past weekend. A lot of efficiency, just a complete effort from all around. Not hurting the bullpen too much either. Pitching all around is just looking fabulous. Home runs are plenty this season. Josh Solomon has two. Nick Levensteins has two. 
Mason Dennison has three. I'm hoping these numbers are correct. If not, you guys can always fact check me. And I will have no issue with it. But I'm hoping these numbers are correct. Tim Conway also has a home run in there. Somewhere. A lot of things were going right for the dogs. Heck, even minimal errors too. If you were at any of these games, you were in for some nice turnouts. Through nine games, the Sabre Dogs are five and four, which not terrible. You know, having a long series with defending champions, that's going to have an effect on it. But the Sabre Dogs working to get a competitive edge over the big sticks from. Badlands, or in other words, Dickinson. Once again, five and four through nine games. And the race is just getting started. Saber Dogs will be on the road for the week with close interest. This week in the recruiting roll call. Thank you, Minot State Track and Field. For officially releasing the full list of the 2020 recruiting class. There are too many of them to do on one episode. And I still have to cover for other teams recruiting. So I will just get 10 of them out of the way. So far I counted 39 total recruits. So you can see why. I will get 10, just 10 for this one. I will get probably another 10 in the next one, then probably another 10, and then one afterwards in the last nine or so. I believe I covered some recent ones, but we got to get to some other recruits for other sports too. So since Minot State Track and Field released their full list, Want to make it fair, being as we already did the same for Minot State Women's Basketball. Let's begin from Wolf Point, Montana, thrower Tori Nygaard. From one of our Class B neighboring cities, Delax Burlington, Chloe Gunderson, also a thrower. We have another thrower from Arley High School in Montana. Peyton Lammerding, again, I apologize if I mispronounce any names. If you hear this and it's incorrect, message me, or if we meet up sometime, we'll talk for a bit, and then you can let me know through there. Distance runner from Reedley High School in Fresno, California, Matthew Jarrett, coming up to Minot State. From a North Dakota Class A high school, West Fargo, from the Packers, mid-distance Emily Hansen, welcome to the Magic City. Another Class A North Dakota high school, from the Williston Coyotes in Williston, North Dakota, mid-distance Gavin Jorgensen. Jessica Martinez will be joining Minot State. From El Toro High School in Rancho Santa Margarita, California. She is a distance runner. Stacy Clark from Western Branch in Chesapeake, Virginia. She does sprints. Corbin Harris coming all the way from Torrington, Wyoming. At Torrington High School, he is a thrower. Capping it off for the first set of Minus State Track and Field recruits, Linda Perez from Madera High School in California. She is a distance runner. Doing a little bit of fact checking on myself, it says 29 signings, but that includes the signings only. I counted 39 new members from signings and transfers. Hopefully, I did not miscount. I am seeing 
a few different numbers here, but I don't think it'll be that big of a deal if, as long as we get everyone squared away. But that was our first batch of Minot State Track and Field recruits. This week in the recruiting roll call, Minot State Wrestling also announcing their full list of the recruiting class of 2020. 15 student athletes joining Minot State. Let's get them all, shall we? Not too many this time around. From Glendale, Arizona in Deer Valley High School, a North Idaho college transfer. Oh boy, get ready for this one. 179 and 0 career record in high school and a four-time state champion in Arizona, Jacob Swift. That is a huge one, a huge get for the Beavers, and just absolutely mind-blowing statistics. So welcome, Jacob. Certainly very lucky and happy, of course, to have you on board. And the same goes for all state champions coming in. From your Mine at High Magicians, we got triplets, Trevin McClanahan, Jacob Carmichael, state champion, and Kelby Armstrong, also state champion as well. I'm sure most of you guys know them well, so welcome boys to Minot State. Coming from a separate North Dakota Class A high school from West Fargo, Cheyenne, Shane Kennedy also coming in to wrestle for the Beavers. Oh yes, gotta include weights. Projected at 165 is Jacob Swift. Projected 149 for Trevin, 184 or 197 for Jacob. Projected 133 pounds for Kelby, and then 197 for Shane. From a Class B North Dakota High School, Skyler Ford joining the Beavers from Kenmare High School. Gabriel Ojeda, hope I got that correct, although... I do not like my odds. Again, sorry if I missed it. From the Las Vegas, Nevada Sport Leadership and Management Academy. He was a 2020 Nevada State Champion, by the way. He's projected at 157. 141 for Skyler Ford, by the way. And then 125 pounds is Xander Tomes, hometown of Waukesha, Wisconsin. Went to Carmen High School of Science and Technology. Shane Hansen from Oceanside, California. Also from Oceanside High School. Projected 197 pounds. Jake Swerpel also going to play for the football team. He is from Livonia High School from Livonia, Michigan. He is going to be projected at 285 pounds. Noah Gallardo from Las Vegas, Nevada, although didn't come from the same place as Gabriel Ojeda. He came from Shadow Ridge High School, another 2020 Nevada state champion. He is weighing in at 184 pounds. From Lake Stevens, Washington, Marysville Pilchuck High School, another state champion, this time from the state of Washington. Coming in either at 174 or 184 pounds, Caden White. Rourke Martin from Roseburg, Oregon and Roseburg High School. Coming in projected at 165 or 174 pounds, kind of within that range. Ethan Ryder coming to wrestle from Gilbert, Arizona of Millennium High School. He is set at 125 pounds. And then lastly... Brendan Barnes from Kalispell, Montana in Flathead High School. 
his weight class is set at 141 pounds. That is all of them. You can find more info on the Minot State Beavers Athletics website. They have headlines for both the track and field and wrestling teams on each of their lists of all of their new recruits coming in. This week in the recruiting roll call, to be determined future Minotauros players as the North American Hockey League Combine was happening this past weekend in Columbus, Ohio. So it looks like some players in some leagues are able to get back onto the ice. And the Toros with Darren Banks, who's a member of the scouting team. Let's see if Mr. Banks can find some gems in there for the Toros. And that finishes up another section of this week in the recruiting roll call series. Before I close out this episode... I want to update you guys on some coaching news. Kind of talked about earlier how this has kind of been the coaching off season, the time of where coaches are switching places or getting hired, moving places, all sorts of interesting news that can be very curious for most. But for Minot State men's basketball, I'm hearing some good things about some added experience on the bench. With the hiring of Randall Herbst, in the past he has coached Minot State men's basketball while coaching in some way for a long time and then spent some time elsewhere at other places. And now he finds himself back here. And so with the year that... The Beavers men's team had, you know, bringing back an old face, more wiser than last time, knows more than what he went through in his past few seasons since being on the Beavers coaching staff last time. He's going to know more and he will have seen some more and experience. It's going to help the players looking up to a voice on the bench with that much credibility. I'm sure they did their homework and they know what they're hoping to get into. And now, after minutes upon minutes upon minutes of talking, I will close out episode four. The Minot Sports Podcast is a production of KMSU TV and Radio, sponsored by Joshua Strong Photography, and the MSU Red and Green Newspaper, both in-house sponsors. I want to thank you guys for getting through this rather longer episode, but as always, the support is much appreciated. Keep on looking out for the Instagram and Twitter for any updates. I'll talk to you guys later. Take care, and have a nice day.